now for the uh, last state of the lecture of this session i request dr graham forster to come to the stage uh, he will talk on difficult to treat hcv in 2022 dr graham forster is a professor of hepatology at queen mary hospital university of london and uh, he is also a consultant at bars health in east london he has a long standing interest in management of chronic viral hepatitis Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for staying until the bitter end. For those of you expecting some wonderful revelation, new drugs, new developments, I'm afraid I have nothing new to give you. The management of difficult to treat hepatitis C is very simple. Identify the patients who are tough to treat, and then make absolutely sure they take every single tablet. Because for most people with hepatitis C, we know you can get away with missing a few doses. We know that if you only take 80% of the medication, your SVR is pretty close to what it is if you take it all. But if you have one of the poor prognostic factors, you need every single pill, and you may even need, horror of horrors, the ribavirin. So the trick with difficult hepatitis C is who needs the intense monitoring, the intense surveillance, and who needs to count the tablets. If we can get the, uh, the slides to work. Gentlemen, it's a beautiful, beautiful computer, and if the slides move forward, we can get on with things. There we go. I've no idea which button it worked. <laughs> Let's think about hepatitis C in three different groups. I want to think about genotype, I want to think about mutations, and I want to think about patients. So let's start with genotype. And you know this, I'm afraid. You guys have got the tiger. You've got the genotype 3. And genotype 3 is the most challenging, not only to treat, but also in terms of progression. And I was interested to hear in the transplant session people talking about transplanting young 30-year-olds with decompensated hep C cirrhosis. And I'm sorry, that's a feature of genotype 3. This is a significantly more aggressive virus and significantly harder to treat. It responds significantly less well to cefospivir-based regimes than any other genotype. This virus, I'm afraid, is intrinsically difficult to manage. And you can see that from the data. This is real-world data from the TRIO network. This is old data now, but look at these SVR rates in genotype 1. It's close to 100%. It is very close to complete cure of everybody. Even in a clinical trial in genotype 3, we do not get those high rates. So you get a real world advantage with genotype one compared to genotype three trials. This is a tough, tough customer. And we'll come on in a few moments to previous treatment and we'll come on to cirrhosis. But if you've got genotype three and cirrhosis, you've got a tough cookie. Of course, sofospivir is not the only kid in town. I think there was a lot of hope when we saw protease inhibitors that protease inhibitors would beat genotype 3 and would allow high rates of response. But here you can see the efficacy in genotypes non-3 with the protease-based regimens and it's getting on for 100%. In genotype 3, it's 95%. And this was a trial looking at low fibrosis genotype 3s. The response rates are a fraction lower in the advanced fibrotics. So even with the protease inhibitors, genotype 3 is a tough customer. And one starts to suspect that it's the NS5A component that is causing problems. And indeed, there are some who are advocating that we should add a protease inhibitor to these regimens and use softvel vox first line for tough genotype 3. And I'm not going to advocate that for Pakistan because offering you food that you can't eat is always rude. We have to use what we've got if we're going to get rid of genotype 3. 
And it gets worse, I'm afraid, when you go into the subtypes. The studies in Pakistan suggest that about 15% of your population have the 3B variant. And 3B is even tougher. This is a Chinese study. You can see here a significant reduction in 3B. And let me alarm you for a moment about the study that we're just finishing in the UK. We have a random screening approach to deep sequencing in England. We take a random subset of patients who've been offered treatment. We pre-sequence them. We don't give the clinicians any of the information. We simply look at what impact it has on SVR. And this is our difficult to treat genotype substudy from that. So these are randomly selected patients. You can see in the genotype 3Bs, the response rate was very poor indeed. Out of a dozen 3Bs treated in England, and we use SoftVel, we use Gleepib as our first line therapies, you can see response rates in 3B were pretty poor. It's a small scale study. I don't really believe that genotype 3B is quite this hard to treat, but it does make the case there are some really angry tigers out there that are going to make it really hard to el achieve elimination. And that data has persuaded Easel to make a strong recommendation that if you have a genotype 3B, you should start with the most potent drugs you have. Softvel Vox is their recommendation. Other options would include Sofosbuvir plus Gleepib. These are very expensive regimens. They're not regimens that we use routinely in England at the moment. They are too expensive even for us. And I appreciate that in Pakistan, this is probably beyond reach. So you've got genotype 3, you've got genotype 3B. What about other variants that make life difficult? This is a very variable virus. You know that hepatitis C is the most variable virus that we have. It mutates at an enormous frequency. It produces billions of virus every week. And one in a thousand of those has a mutation within it. So this is an extraordinarily variable virus. This is a GWAS study. This is deep sequencing of hepatitis C patients. These are all genotype threes. And we're looking here at this huge variation. So your patients, you're not treating a virus, you're treating a swarm of viruses. And many of these mutations generate some degree of resistance. The ones that have been highlighted are those in the NS5A and the NS5B region. And the Rottweilers are those in NS5A that are stable. Because the NS5A mutations stick. They don't disappear with time. They're stable, replication-competent mutants. And they make life very difficult. This is Maria Bhuti's study, a very important study looking at genotype 3 and cirrhosis. They're treated with SOFVEL, so treated with a state-of-the-art genotype 3 treatment. And you can see that if you have these mutations, if you have the Y93 mutation, your response rate is reduced from 91 to 84 percent. So if you have cirrhosis and Y93, your SVR rate is sub 90 percent. And you can overcome this by adding ribavirin. So for genotype 3 cirrhotics, with the Y93 mutation, you may want to think about ribavirin. And interestingly, when you go back to the plot, it's not just the NS5A. There are mutations that reduce response in non-NS5A regions. I don't understand how mutations in the protease domain can affect response to sofosbuvir and S5A. And we believe that's due to the way the proteins fold, the way they interact in the replication complex. But there are troublesome mutations out there. And I know what you're thinking. You're starting to think, are we going to see a lot of these resistant mutations in Pakistan? Are these going to come through in our patients who don't respond first time? Are we going to end up with the nightmare scenario that we treat a lot of people, we generate these mutations, and we have drug-resistant hepatitis C in Pakistan. And yes, I do believe that's a possibility, and I think we have to be careful 
that we don't generate that. These are other mutations of interest. Let me look now at the polymerase protein. This is a study in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. They were treated in England with SOFDAC. This was prior to the licensing of treatments. You can see that decompensated cirrhosis with SOFDAC has terrible response rates if you have genotype 3. So decompensated cirrhotics are even harder to treat. And when we looked at these mutations in a replication assay, we identified sophosphavir resistant mutations and sequencing those showed some common resistant patterns. Drug resistant hepatitis C with a mutation you can see at A150. And A150 is my favorite mutation because it really cripples the way the virus responds. And in fact, when we looked back at our trial, looking at sophosphavir treatment, you can see that A150V is associated with treatment failure. So this is a viral mutation that reduces response to sophosphavir. If you take that mutation and you put it in a model of hep C replication, it destroys the replication response to sophosphavir. So this is a mutation in the polymerase protein of hepatitis C. It's common in genotype 3 and it stops sophosphavir working. So there are some really troublesome customers out there and we need to be very careful that we don't generate them in our populations. So let's move from the virus and let's look at the patient. And the only feature in your patients that matters is cirrhosis. Nothing else counts. We've overcome the diabetic problem. We've overcome the obesity problem. We've overcome everything except cirrhosis. And even with soft vel, the rates of response are reduced in those with cirrhosis. And for soft DAC in this clinical trial, response rates were very poor indeed. This is 12 weeks of soft DAC. If you have cirrhosis, 12 weeks of soft DAC just doesn't cut it. The message from me today is that if you treat your cirrhotic patients with 12 weeks of soft DAC, you are going to fail in many patients. And all those mutations that I've just worried you about are going to come to the fore. So it is really important that we identify cirrhosis and we extend the duration of treatment. Because if we extend the duration of treatment, if we add in ribavirin, we can overcome it. And here's data from India. This is SOFTAC. This is a community study of Indian subcontinent genotype 3. It was done in the Punjab in India. And you know the response to this. Over 90% of patients with cirrhosis responded. So SOFTAC for 24 weeks in cirrhosis, 92% in an Indian genotype 3 population. If you use 12 weeks, it's less than 70%. So please, work out whether your patient has cirrhosis. If you think they might have cirrhosis, extend the treatment. Another little game, I'm afraid, is the presence of liver nodules and liver malignancy. If you have pre-existing HCC, your SVR is dramatically reduced, down to about 80% in most of the studies. In my practice, if I see a patient who doesn't respond to antiviral therapy, we do a triple phase CT or an MRI, and we keep finding little cancers. Most people respond to therapy. If they don't respond to therapy, either we've missed the cirrhosis or they've got a little liver cancer. And the non-responders to treatment we retreat with Softvel Vox, but we put them on an aggressive scanning program. They get an ultrasound scan every four months for the first 12 months, and then they go on to six monthly screening. So if your patient fails and your patient's taken the treatment, think about cancer. You'll be surprised how many you'll find. My final message is obvious to you, but not always obvious to your patient. The pills don't work unless you take them. And we know that giving patients pills is the start of the journey, not the end of the journey. We have to make sure patients comply with therapy. We have to make sure they take the treatment. And I know there are wonderful studies in drug users saying that if you give patients a box of tablets and tell them to take them and make a telephone call, they'll do enough and they'll get good SVRs. 
And I'm sure that's right unless you've got genotype 3 and unless you've got cirrhosis. So in the Pakistani community, we need to be really clear, take all the tablets. We must get compliance right. One of the tricks that we have for compliance is helping patients with support. This is data from England looking at peers. Peers are people with hepatitis C. We train them to monitor and mentor our patients. So we give every patient a support worker to help them through treatment. And you can see from this study that it increases compliance with treatment by 12%. People with a friend who's helping them take the tablets do much better. And I think that's something we need to think about in Pakistan, particularly for those cirrhotic patients. So what to do? If the world was perfect, you would take every patient, you would deep sequence their virus, you would find the A150s, you'd find the Y93s, you'd give them enhanced therapy. This is not a perfect world. And I can tell you in England, we don't pre-treatment sequence. If your patient doesn't have cirrhosis, just give them the pills, they'll be fine. The non-cirrhotic hepatitis C, even your genotype threes, will melt away with a simple course of tablets. But if you have cirrhosis, you need to increase the length of treatment and you need to improve compliance. They're the boys and girls you need to talk to, measure the tablets, make sure they comply. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, this is the off spinner and it's a tricky wicket. And genotype three with cirrhosis is the googly. That's the ball that'll catch you out. That'll take your middle stump. And the way around that is identify the cirrhotics, compliance, compliance, compliance. Get them to take the pills. Mr. Chairman, I believe genotype three with cirrhosis in Pakistan is your Achilles heel. I think with careful attention to detail, with early identification of cirrhosis, prolonged therapy with good compliance, you can overcome it, but it's not going to be easy. It's going to be as tricky as our boys will be tomorrow evening when we take you on in Karat. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Graham Foster, for such, an, uh, such a nice talk. Now I request uh, both chairpersons for their concluding remarks. First speaker, Professor Bilal Hamid gives very comprehensive, informative talk in which he highlights uh, clinical challenges and integrated care model for match management. And second, Professor Graham Foster gives a very valuable and knowledgeable talk in which he highlights the importance to manage the uh, HCV infection. Uh, I thank both the speakers for excellent talks. Uh, Dr. Bilal Amir from US has been gracing uh, our uh, conferences and he's a regular presenter. And uh, his uh, stress was that uh, Nefer Nash is a multi-organ uh, disease and it needs a multidisciplinary sort of approach. Uh, Professor Graham Foster is also a person who we have been listening to in the past, for the past so many years and he's been a regular uh, visitor and a presenter to our uh, conferences. And his stress was that it's extremely important to have good compliance uh, if you want to cure your HCV patients and he stressed that you have to extend the treatment to six months if you have cirrhosis. I thank both the speakers for the excellent talks. Thank you. Uh, can I have a question from uh, Dr. Graham Faster? Graham, can I, have a, can I ask a question? Okay. Uh, this is just an observation. Uh, some of our patients who have cleared uh, serology for hepatitis C, we see them three or four years later in follow-up. 
and they come back with cirrhosis, whereas their scores have gone up. And is it, is it an observation in genotype three patients? Or, uh, you know, this is something we, uh, we are... The other question is that when you say extend the treatment, what is the duration for that extension? Thank you. Thank you very much. They're, they're great questions. I'm going to hand you over to the gentleman on your left-hand side for the first question, because I think a lot of these patients with hepatitis C that's cleared have other factors, particularly metabolic syndrome. And genotype 3 does predispose to diabetes and insulin resistance, and certainly we're seeing in our clinics exactly what you're seeing, which is patients who clear the hepatitis C. Some of our patients go back to drinking large amounts of alcohol, but a lot of our patients have some degree of insulin resistance and obesity, and I think it's the fatty liver disease that progresses. Increasingly, I'm recommending that patients with genotype 3, hepatitis C, and fibro scans of 9 to 10 go on surveillance programs and stay in the clinic. For the genotype 1s, where they don't have the association with insulin resistance, I tend to discharge. But increasingly, I'm following up my genotype 3s. And I think it's more fatty liver disease than virus-related. Your second question about duration is critical. The data we have at the moment is 24 weeks. I'm a little concerned it may not be enough. And I just wonder if particularly for the cirrhotic 3Bs, we might need to extend further and we might need to go beyond. I'm particularly worried about soft DAC in the genotype 3B cirrhotic population where we don't have enough data. As you know, with uh, a, a huge team of colleagues from Pakistan, we're embarking upon a big study to ask exactly that question. We're sequencing patients, we're looking at SVR rates. So I hope in 12 months I'll be able to come back and give you some information. And we have a sad team here who contributed huge numbers of patients. We've got 11,000 people studied so far. So I hope we'll get an answer for you as to who are the patients you need to extend beyond 24 weeks. Because I think there will be those who need it. My final comment is probably about ribavirin. I like ribavirin in the cirrhotics. I think it adds value. My patients hate it, and realistically, it's tough to make a cirrhotic take it. No, we will have a tea break. We will be back after 20 minutes for the next session. <laughs>